Good morning. Welcome to Math 261, this multivariable calculus at Delta College. This is Thursday, October 7, class session. And our topics for the morning are listed here. Uh, I did receive a very nice question. And I thought I'd begin by looking at that question with everyone. It relates a little bit to the homework problem you're submitting tonight. But the homework problem you're submitting tonight is a little more work than this. So this uh, might help you out when you're working or finishing your problem tonight. But let's just look at this basic problem to start with. Uh, you submitted your exam on Tuesday night. So organizing those and reading those, and I'll get those back to you as soon as possible. I did post solutions to the exam if you want to review them. And maybe when you get your paper back, it'll be more meaningful. Remember, you can you know take your paper returned to you, graded. You can look at the solutions I post. If you have any question about why I marked something or why I wrote something, don't hesitate to ask because I make errors in reading things as often as the next person. So I don't mind at all if you ask questions about how I mark something. I only ask that you look at the answers first, just so you have an idea of one way you could have done the work. Sometimes my answers are lacking. Sometimes I have an error in an answer. Okay, let's look at this problem, this basic problem from section 4.1, because it fits into our theme this week. And our theme this week is that we've begun to study surfaces. And the idea is surfaces can be exceptionally crazy things, could be very complicated or messy things. But we would like to eliminate the worst craziness. We would like to examine surfaces that are predictable and continuous. And then later, smooth, differentiable. But how do we recognize problems and how do we eliminate them? If I'm given a surface that has problems in it, maybe I can't avoid having to study the problems, but I have to know where the problems are, how to deal with them before I know how to study what the problems are. So our goal overall is that we're gonna be looking at smooth and continuous surfaces. You know, many processes in nature and science exhibit smooth and continuous behavior. Some don't, but we wanna knock out that great majority of processes that exhibit smooth and continuous behavior. We wanna know how we can study those effectively. That's what calculus is best at. It's one of the things that calculus is best at. So if we pull up this equation right here, this is four, three, number uh, 43 in section four one, sketch function of x comma y equals two minus, x squared plus y squared using level curves. Verify with appropriate technology. So we want to produce an answer and we want to have some way of checking that that answer makes sense. Is my paper ready to move? So when I look at this function, the thing that strikes me first is the sum of squares right here. I mean, yes, I'm taking the square root of the sum of squares. Yes, I'm uh, subtracting that from a constant. But the basic idea is this sum of squares gives me something to focus on. 
in a circle, the sum of two squares is constant. So if I was living on a circle, the x squared plus y squared would have a constant value. And the square root of x squared plus y squared would have a constant value. And the opposite of it, likewise, and then two minus square root of x squared plus y squared would have a constant value. I'm interested in the places where the function has constant value because those are things I can build my drawing on. So let's look at the xy plane. And, and this, this drawing is not gonna be remarkable or too exciting, but we can use it as a method of looking at another problem and another problem. So we'll do this basic problem and then use it to look at a more complicated problem in a second. So when x squared plus y squared is one, let's just pretend that's a circle of radius one right there. Then this value is one, square root of one is one, two minus one is one. So actually at that moment, well, let me pause to readmit someone there. Uh, sometimes you get disrupted or kicked out of the room depending on your bandwidth or quality. In that case, Zoom will try to reacquire you or the Zoom application on your computer, mobile device will try to bring you back into the meeting. But if it fails to do that, you know, wait for a few seconds. If it fails to do that, then just you can click and re-enter the meeting and I'll see you trying to re-enter the meeting. Okay, circle of radius one, puts a one inside this root and the function value is one. Let's try a circle of radius two. I'm not drawing the surface right now. What I'm drawing are curves where the function's value is constant. These are called the level curves. Here's a circle of radius two. And on the circle of radius two, I have the square root of two, two minus the square root of two. Ugh, it's not a convenient number, 1.414. So two minus that is 0.586 approximately. I'll just draw two more circles. Square root of three and square root of four. These are very raw circles, not very exciting. But square root of three, I'd have two minus about 1.7-ish. That's the value of this function about 0.3-ish. Square root of four is a little more friendly. Two minus two is zero. So, the one, two, three, four refers to the radius of the circles, but each one of these circles has a value of the function attached to it. When the radius of the circle is four, uh, excuse me, when the radius is two, if x squared plus y squared is four, the radius is two. Yeah, let's, let's be more careful. I'm rushing and I'm in a hurry to speak. So, Let's say this more carefully. When the radius is four, x squared plus y squared is 16. Two minus root 16 is two minus four. That's a value of negative two. Okay, let's ground ourselves. When the radius is three, x squared plus y squared is nine. Two minus square root of nine, two minus three is negative one. When the radius of the circle is two, x squared plus y squared is four. Square root of four is two, and two minus two is zero. When the radius is one, x squared plus y squared is one. The square root of x squared plus y squared is one, and two minus one is one. I'm getting a little bit distracted there because sometimes when you say the square root of one is one and you get in the habit of saying x squared plus y squared equals one is a circle of radius one, 
Well, so it is, not because the one is equal to r, but because the one is equal to r squared. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Like as these circles go out, these values or heights of the function are growing. Uh, I could let x squared plus y squared equal zero. I could have a radius zero circle. And if I had a radius zero circle, apparently this function's value would be two. So you can attach these numbers to these level curves to help you see three dimensions. Apparently this uh, function is falling as I go further away from the origin. As I go further distance away from the origin, I'm subtracting larger and larger numbers. I could try a raw drawing of that. And I can use my knowledge of geometry in a second, but I think the confirmation is gonna come with the technology. So if I say I'm at zero and zero, then the function has a value of two. If I say I'm at circle of radius one in the xy plane. I'm at a value of one. So I could draw a circle of radius one having a value of height one. If I'm at circle of radius two, I have a height of zero. I could call this two here. And this is now getting to the limits of my drawing ability. Circle of radius three, height minus one. Eh. My drawing ability is fading fast. There's some kind of mountain or peak, because as I go further out, I'm going further down in the X, Y, Z plane. Before we appeal to technology and use a special parameterization, look at the function in this fashion as well. Two minus the square root of x squared plus y squared. If you're setting that equal to the function's height, we'll call it z, that creates a relationship among x, y, and z. And so I could square this object, I could isolate the square root before I square it. Let's say I write x squared plus y squared equals z minus two opposite. Bring the root to the left, bring the z to the right and use a minus sign here to write the z in a convenient fashion. Square both sides, x squared plus y squared equals z minus two squared, because the squaring gets rid of the negative sign here. And what I should have is x squared plus y squared minus z minus two squared equals zero. Now I have no negative signs, I'm generally talking about, excuse me, I didn't move my paper up, generally talking about an ellipsoid. One minus sign, generally talking about a hyperboloid of one sheet, two minus signs, often talking about a hyperboloid of two sheets. But that's if I have a number on this right-hand side. With the zero here, I'm setting up, you know, pretend you blocked out the X value or the Y value. I'm setting up straight lines. If X is zero, then I have Y squared equals Z minus two squared. If Y is zero, then I have X squared equals Z minus two squared. And this sets up Z minus two plus or minus equals Y. This sets up X equals plus or minus Z squared. Uh, z minus two. 
when you take the square root of the square, you introduce the absolute value, so you have to account for the plus or minus. And these are straight lines. In the plane, yz plane, or here in the xz plane. So this gives a little context to our drawing. And then we recognize this as an elliptic cone. So we have straight lines in this plane, straight lines in the yz plane. And what we have here is an elliptic cone taking off at 45 degrees from this point, zero, zero, two. So we have a pointed object. Notice I only have the lower half of this. I never had any value larger than two because I was only subtracting a positive number from two. And the fact that I only have the bottom half of this cone was from this stage of the equation right here. So this is a full elliptic cone, but we're only looking at the lower half or the nape of the cone. Let's draw this with Mathematica in two ways. I'll open up my Mathematica notebook and share it with you because I'm gonna use this as a model for how we could draw parameterized surfaces in a different problem. Open up a new document here. And then, give it a title and share it with you. Section. Four point one, forty three. Share screen. Go. And I want to show you a particular option in the plotting command. So I might have to go full screen here in a second. Let me open up that window a bit. Let me pump up the words so you might be able to read them better. So. Let's input this function raw as it stands right now. Make some adjustments, so hang on. There's a raw function. This is not defining a function right now because I haven't told Mathematica what the variables are. The underscore following these variables in the function definition says to Mathematica, these are going to be variables in a function. And Mathematica then colors them green. It's not a bad idea to input the function you're working with, because then you can refer to it in the plot structures without having to retype it all the time or copy and paste it. OK, so we got that structure right there. So let's just try a simple straight ahead plot. Plot 3D and let's say f of x comma y. I don't have to use underscores here. I'm not defining the function. I'm referring to the function. And let's do x from, uh, well, we went all the way out in our plane here to minus four to four, right? So that sounds like a reasonable place to start. Change that to y. Here's my surface. Well, it's got some kind of sharp point to it. And since I know it's a cone, maybe I can even visualize the cone. But right here, what's distracting me is these grid lines. This is the mesh that they've put on the surface right here. Another thing that's distracting me is the different sizes of the units, because I thought this was taken off at 45 degrees. So I'm going to make some adjustments to this right away. And I'm just using simple returns, not shift returns to execute, but simple returns to space out my options for the plot command here. So first thing let's do is let's set the aspect ratio of this to be one to one to one. Okay, now this looks more believably like 45 degrees. Uh, you might even play with the coloring of this, coloring it by height or such. Let me shrink this box down. But what I really want to do is display those circles. So I am going to take this off and then go full screen. So 
Sorry for the interruption. I should have started in full screen. And let's look up some documentation. The function that I want you to look up. I could start with plot 3D, but the function or option that I want you to look up is the mesh option. Uh, let me, I made that larger so that you could see this on my screen. And then they've got these pre-drawn box sizes. First, let's look at plot 3D. Okay, details and options. So straight ahead plotting of a function. So evaluates function being connected over, visualizes a set of elements, gaps are left where it can't evaluate. I'm looking for, now this is the, this by the way is the details and options. So when you look up something in the documentation, you get a general how it's used, and now you get all the details. Sometimes you just skip to the examples, but I'm looking for among the details, I'm looking for options. And the option I'm looking for, axes, boundary, box ratios. Maybe I should have used box ratios instead of aspect ratios. Okay, we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, Color, color scaling function, a color function. Maybe I'd like to color this. Maybe I'll illustrate that. Filling and exclusions, you know, anything you want to avoid, like where a function is not defined, that might be exclusions. Maybe you can use exclusions on what you're drawing for tonight's work. But I'm interested in mesh and mesh functions. How many mesh lines to draw and how to determine the placement of these mesh lines. So let's look at mesh and mesh functions. Again, I get details right here, but let's, instead of slogging through the details, let's look at some of the different images that I have here. Not too exciting. Let's look at mesh functions. Oh, I have no idea what this is, but I know it's got contour lines on it. So. First of all, I could just straight ahead steal this option right here. And then we'll explain a little bit what the option means, but this is gonna draw five contour lines in the third variable. It's a little bit opaque, that command. But let's take this over here and just see what happens. Let's do my uh, indenting. There we go. Now we see the circles that make up this function. And in fact, we see that our drawing, even though I misspoke the radiuses in the original drawing, my drawing of the XY plane is not too bad. My drawing of the XY plane was equally spaced circles. Okay, now apparently aspect ratio, box ratio, maybe let's go to box ratio here. Uh, it's not going to let me use box ratios of one to one to one. Okay. I think aspect ratio was acceptable, but there's box ratios of one to one to one. Notice though that this is kind of awkward because I have different X, Y, and Z heights. So I think box ratios is going to be more relevant when I have a specific box plot range. And so let's run this from uh, minus two to two strictly on the z-axis. So minus four to four, minus four to four. And, oh, okay, here we go. How about, those are eight units each, right? So how about minus, four to four in the Z range. I could shift those. I gotta separate these by commas. I gotta put a comma under here. Okay, now I have a appropriately scaled cone right here. It's still a little awkward because my cone is wrapped in a box. This doesn't feel like a cone. It's a little bit too large here. So let me cut it down again. 
uh, although color was not asked for, I want to go back and look at color functions. So let's go back here. Let's say color functions. Color function scaling, color function blending. Let's see what kind of interesting things. Here's a really interesting color function. And again, I just hopped into the examples. Here, I'm going to color my surface by height. So in this figure right here, I can see the surface colored by height. So sometimes that's useful. I'm just going to grab that and place it in here. Where should I place it? You, you have freedom to place some things, right? What did I insert? I think I grabbed too much of this function, didn't I? Copy. Okay. Get rid of that. And I know I got it twice for some reason. Okay, good. Uh, that doesn't add a great deal, but sometimes if you're trying to identify high and low places on a surface, that color function is useful. Oh, by the way, if you don't like this dead space here at the top of this function, I could run the Z coordinate only up to two, but now I have eight units, eight units, six units. And I have to see how that works, but that's a ratio of four to three to three, right? So if I wanted the units to be one to one, I could set these ratios as four to three to three. In general, you could just take the length of each of the X, Y, and Z spaces and use that as your box ratios. That would keep you a nice solid one-to-one -one unit box. Okay, two more things I wanna illustrate about this though. So let's say I wanted to strictly concentrate on these contour lines. Let's go to contour plot, not contour plot. I gotta learn how to spell that. And let's contour plot this function. And let's use the range I did before. In fact, I could even copy and paste just those objects right there. And illustrate what this does for you. This just isolates. I made it angry. Oh, no, this just isolates the contours in the plane. This is not a three-dimensional picture. This is a two-dimensional picture. But what it does for you is shows you height one, height zero, height minus one, little tips as you go over the lines, height minus two, height minus three. It does not seem to see the tip of this, okay, but because it didn't necessarily check that function. Maybe we could make it see the tip of that in another time. But what I really want to show you is, I want to do a nice ice cream cone cone right here. So instead of plot 3D, let's compare this to copy, comma, paste. Now this is a good trick for doing plots side by side. Because I have two plot structures separated by comma, inside a list. And I did some demo of this in the exam solutions if you want to look at that. Look at two separate plot structures in a list separated by comma. Remember, list is the fundamental object in Mathematica. So what this is going to do is give me a list of plots. Since I put two identical things in that list, I get two identical plots. But now let's modify the second plot, not to straight ahead plot, but to parametric plot. And for a parametric plot, I want to focus on the circles. Uh, I'm not even sure if I need all these arguments. Maybe I'll ditch them as time goes on or yeah, let's ditch them now because I have them above if I want to copy them. And so for parametric plot, let's focus on feeding this function circles. So I'm going to describe points, x comma y comma f of x, y. These will be points in space 
x, y, f of x, y. If I just do it like this, I do not get any different result. I just get the same cone with the same mesh that I did not enjoy. But if I replace the x and y with polar coordinates, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and then take that x and y and insert it into the function, what I'm doing is feeding the function circles. Now I could have the letter theta, the Greek letter theta, Mathematica and documentation shows you how to do that, but just because I was in a hurry, I'll just type the word theta and let that be my theta variable. I have to specify the R and theta ranges, right? So let's let R range from uh, zero to four, and let's let theta range from zero to two pi. Notice that this is much less manipulating than the one up front because I didn't draw the mesh functions. I did the parameterization. In fact, from above, and I can make this larger for you, you see the circles that I used to parameterize and you see the radial lines. Now, this is what we feel is more like a cone, like an ice cream cone here, right? And I can modify this now in some ways. We want an ice cream cone based on ellipses. Let's put a two in there. Oh, now I have an ice cream cone that's kind of squashed in one direction. Do I want only a portion of that ice cream cone? Let's do from three to four. Then I I forget the funny, uh, it's not fulcrum. I'm not looking for that, but the name of just a ring like this in geometry or in mechanical objects. Do I want just a part of the angle, three pi divided by two. Then I can just take any part of that cone that I want to. I'll go backwards, undo. Mathematica does not have infinite undo, so you gotta be a little bit careful about that. And it also does not have autosave. Now, actually you think, wow, any general program I use has infinite undo and autosave. But the problem in Mathematica with those two commands is, let's take infinite undo. Remember, you are setting the values of variables and you're executing commands or routines based on those values. So if you undo, what you're gonna do is you're gonna scramble variable values often. So you gotta be careful about that. So Mathematica, They've thought about this for several years. What's a good way to implement that? It's actually not an easy technical problem. Autosave, I think they could implement a lot better, but I don't know the technical problems they're facing. Okay, so this right here is what I really wanted to show you at the beginning. Choosing a smart parameterization to make a quick and clean drawing of that object. I could still color by heights if I wanted to. I could take the Z hue from above. There are other coloring functions that are kind of attractive, so uh, you can experiment with that. And here, if I don't want to see those mesh lines, remember I could say mesh is none. Sometimes it's nice to not see those mesh lines just to see the object right here. And I can add the transparencies and any particular color I want to see. Okay, so that's what I wanted to illustrate with you first here. So don't neglect to jump into the documentation of Mathematica. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I missed the chat, but let me address this. Z equals two and Y equals three, is that different? It's a slightly different, and maybe I could give you uh, a tip on that. Here, let's go back to that because this is a really good question and I want you to learn how to manipulate things like that too. 
So the question is, what about the idea of specifying a height, like z equals one? It's a level curve or a contour. There's a little bit of disagreement about how people refer to those. And what is the example of specifying a value like uh, y equals two? And this is a trace. Let's go back to that object we were looking at. So excellent question. The problem is when I'm doing full screen, oh, I don't want that one. When I'm doing full screen and the chat window blinks out, so I don't always see the chat window immediately. Let's take and remove some clutter here. By the way, these bars on the right-hand side, they control how Mathematica displays things. So you can close or open the bars by clicking on the double clicking on the bars or clicking on the triangles that are attached to the bars. So sometimes that helps you if you just want to hide that image result, you could double click to focus only on the command and then show people the image when you want to show them the image. If you're highlighting the cell here on the right hand side, I could just delete the whole cell. Let's also delete this image on the left and take out my list. So now I just have my function and my parametric plot. So let's add two things to parametric plot. Let's call this cone, give it a name so we can refer to it. And then let's call another thing plane. Sometimes you come across reserved words in Mathematica, then just give them unique names. Let's say plane will be a simple plot. The first one that you mentioned, plot 3D, capital D, excuse me. And let's make it plot at height one, comma. And then let's borrow, uh, oh, I already erased some of these things right here. So let's, I could borrow the polar coordinates, but let's just say X comma Y. So let's say X comma minus two, two. And let's say Y comma minus two, two. This fits into what we're doing because I want you to visualize surfaces, right? So there's a plane right there. And now let's do the plane and the cone at the same time. Do you notice both the cone and the plane were displayed? And that just is using up real estate. Semicolon for any Mathematica command suppresses output. So I don't need the output there, but now I'll do show uh, cone plane. And there's my plane, my cone being struck by my plane. Uh, that color function is a little bit too distracting, a little bit too psychedelic. So let me remove that and try again. Excuse me. There. Okay. Now, if I wanted to do things like decorate this plane, let's like make it transparent, stuff like that. Let's make it blue. I like the fact the cone has no mesh on it, but I don't want to spend time decorating, but we'll say plot style. We'll do a little decoration here. Let's make the plane uh, red and fairly transparent. Opacity is on a scale of zero to one. I have messed up my braces. I now notice I rehit the definition of the variable, but I have to rehit the show command. If you want to make this immediate so that I only need one entry, what I could do is move the show command into this cell. Now, when I execute the cell, this is one cell, I will execute the show command at the same time as I define the variables. Let's add one more thing to this. I want to see that. Let's add a intersection curve. A new variable, and let's call it parametric plot. 3D, and let's draw that circle where they intersect. 
since that's at z equals one, I know that's a circle of radius one. So we will draw a circle of radius one and height one. It's a very simple circle where they intersect. So we say, now I'll borrow the parametric plot from up here. This illustrates something good about parametric plot too. Do you see I use parametric plot on a cone with two variables, r and theta, and that automatically creates a surface. But if I only use the theta, you know, set r equal to one, then I will only draw a one dimensional circle. I don't want a function value here, although I could use the function value one, I'll just set it height equal to one. And then I only have to specify one variable, which is theta. Good. Now, first thing I'm going to do is put no semicolon there just so I can see what I created. I created a circle. Certainly, I created a circle. Okay, now let's put a semicolon to suppress output and put intersection curve here. Look how Mathematica wants to help you. I-N-T-E-R. Oh, Mathematica says we have a variable called intersection curve. That's why I wasn't afraid of the long name. Okay, now I have my plane and my intersection curve. This intersection curve is called level curve. By the way, if I remove the plane, I can just focus on that intersection curve right there. Now, people have arguments about whether to call this circle that I just drew a level curve or a contour. I think legally, when you draw the curve of constant height on a surface. Legally, I think you should call it a contour. Sometimes people slip and just call this a level curve. But if you said either one, people would kind of accept it unless they were really stodgy and legalistic. Level curve is what we drew in the plane. It's like a map of contours. Like when you go hiking and you see the altitude lines on a mountain on a two-dimensional map, they tell you the levels, there are the level curves. But here, contour means I'm drawing on the surface. Now, we had another plane that we wanted to bring. Uh, so let's call this uh, plane 01. Notice if I call this plane 01, like renaming it, then in order to redraw it. Now, why did Mathematica draw a plane here? Because I renamed it plane 01. Because in its memory, Mathematica still has plane defined. <laughs> That's what I mean about undoing and name collisions. So I update this to plane 01 because now I want to create a plane 02. Let's create this plane to be the y equals 2 plane so I can show you a trace. But the plane y equals 2 is not a function. So I cannot use plot3d, which only plots functions. Let's use contour plot to my advantage. Contour plot takes equations and tries to find the points that satisfy them. So if I say y equals two, and I have to say mathematical equals two, not assignment equals two. I'm not assigning a variable. I'm describing a mathematical equation right here. Then I can have Mathematica collect all the points that are on that plane. Now, what I have to do is tell Mathematica where to search for those points. And to search for those points, I need to specify three dimensions. So I'm going to run this from, uh, looks like I'm running everything from minus two to two. I guess that's a good starting place. So now I have a new variable called plane zero two. And plane zero two is going to draw this vertical plane equation y equals two. Now, by the way, this is not a bad way to organize yourself, right? Let's define a function. Let's assemble variables. Let's put the variables into a show command. That's not a bad way to proceed. Let's add plane zero two right here. Notice plane zero two in both cases is colored blue. And I remind you that when a variable is shown the blue color, then Mathematica is saying, 
I don't know what you're talking about yet because we haven't did shift enter to assign this variable. Assign the variable, there's the plane that's striking that cone. I think I might even expand the size of that plane, right? Well, we can play with that in a second. Uh, I want to isolate this curve where these intersect right here, right? So I want to do transparency on this too. So I can modify this as I did modify the one above. Uh, plane zero two comma, got it. I can't use plot style. I have to use contour style because I'm drawing a contour. In mathematics, mine, the contour is the three dimensional level surface, not the blue ring here. I'm referring to three-dimensional level service. Let's make it blue and transparent. And we execute, there it is. That's a little bit easier to see. Now let's see if we can describe this curve right here. Now I'll go back to my paper for a second. That curve, remember, I have Z equals two, sorry, back to my paper. Z equals two minus the square root of X squared plus Y squared. So when Y is two, this is Z equals two minus X squared plus four. And I could use this equation to define a curve in mathematics. I could also solve to see what this equation represents. In fact, it represents a hyperbola. A vertical plane that strikes a cone generates a hyperbola branch. But I could just go straight ahead with this equation into Mathematica and see what I get. So we're gonna do intersection curve zero one. And now we'll do intersection curve zero two. I'm gonna update my variable names. And intersection curve zero two this will be a simpler parameterization. Let's just say that I want to do X equals variation. Y is equal to two on this blue plane. And Z is equal to two minus the square root of uh, X squared minus four. Uh, plus four, excuse me. So this is a very straight ahead parameterization. X is the variable that's changing. Y is always two. And Z was defined in terms of X. So I just need to run X from something in that box to something in that box. Let's say minus two to two. Ah, very good, thank you. I'm being too quick. I apologize. So, oh, by the way, uh, I can pop this notebook. I can share this within the chat window, but we'll do that in a second if you want to have this notebook, but you have the video about how to create it. Okay, I created intersection curve zero one. I just renamed the intersection curve. Here's intersection curve zero two with the parameterization of the curve that I expect to draw. So, X will vary, Y will be fixed at two, and then this will be the description of Z based on my calculations. I broke that command down. So let's do intersection curve zero one and intersection curve. Oh, I haven't executed intersection curve zero two, so it doesn't recognize it yet. Well, let's execute. And now let's add intersection curve zero two. I could have typed it out. Let's do some formatting in the show command. I could have my cone, my planes, my intersection curves. And here we go. There's that intersection curve on that blue thing. Now, what I could do for my intersection curves is plot style. And make this. one black and the other one red. Notice if I don't specify anything but a single 
value for the option. I don't have to wrap it in parentheses. And let's make this one red. I should have done it the other way around, but this colors that intersection curve red. I could have extended the intersection curve by making this minus four to four. I could have extended the plane. I could have extended the blue plane. Maybe this one should be blue and this one should be red. I'm going a little bit too fast here, but this line is called a trace. It's a snapshot of the curve. It's like you slice the curve with a knife and you got the edge that is left over. This is a trace. The level curve, the contour, is when you slice in the Z direction. When you slice in the X or Y direction, you get a trace. Okay, that uh, addressed the question about it. And you're gonna, you could do this on the homework problem you're working on for tonight. It's kind of interesting how you can really, really clarify something in an image just with a few nicely defined commands. And don't look at a list of commands like this and say, oh, I will never come up with these commands. There's too many moving pieces. How did you do that? No, no, no. You build the commands one step at a time, add the color, add the transparency, add the contours. Don't think of springing a fully formed answer onto the screen in one step, okay? But you can add to objects like this. So I want to see, I don't know if I can even do this, but let me save this notebook. I'm sure I can do this. I just don't know how it comes across on your end. So let's talk about level and trace curves. Let me save that onto my desktop. I'm in a dialog box you don't see because I'm not sharing screen. And now that I have that, I think I can attach a file to the chat window. And you should have this function, Mathematica Notebook. How did that come across to you? Uh, you can just toss that into the chat. I think I put the Mathematica notebook in the chat. You could download and then use it. You can modify it for your homework problem if you like, but your homework problem has a little other twist to it that we haven't discussed yet. Did, you, did that come across in the chat window for you? Okay, excellent. Uh, so uh, don't, uh, don't overlook this. So if we're doing an example in class and you'd like to just have the notebook and, there's, and if there's no reason why I shouldn't give you the notebook, like some kind of special thing that I'm doing for a test question, I could just save and hand over the notebook to you in the chat window. Okay, very good. So where do I wanna go with this? We're gonna take a break in a second, but let's talk about where we wanna go with this. So the reason I wanted to spend that time on that, somewhat more time than I wanted, but that's okay, is because this weapon of drawing surfaces with parameterizations, basic parameterizations, this can really, really help you examine bad surfaces or bad points on the surface. So now we're gonna move to another topic and I'll show you uh, fancier parameterization. It's a little bit, also has application to your homework. So what do I mean by limits of functions of multiple variables? That's where we're going to go next. Dash line, because we're going to take a break first. But then that'll also lead us, and the trace example that I just gave you leads you into this topic called partial derivatives. Okay, so I don't mind showing you that Mathematica stuff because it's going to increase your powers to investigate things. And that's why I'm saying if you have any issues on Mathematic Notebooks, just send me the notebook and I'll help you find out what's going on. So let's come back at, well, let's talk about there, talk about 903. 
And then we're going to talk about the topic of limits of functions of multivariables and how to exploit the parameterizations to draw surfaces that are kind of kooky. I'm going to mute my microphone while I stretch my legs. And you're welcome to do the same.
Okay, very good. Let's go an extra second right there, excuse me. So, how can we use this idea of prioritization to our advantage if we need to describe limits of functions? Why do we need to know what the limit of a multivariable function is? And because we have this hierarchy, page two. Let me get ready to tear that off and move it up. We have this hierarchy from our previous calculus experience. Limit, continuity, differentiability. And limit is the fundamental concept on which continuity and differentiability are based just in your one-dimensional experience. A function is continuous if what? The function exists, the limit exists, and the function and the limit are equal. That's the three-pronged test for continuity in any format. F of x naught exists. Limit as x goes to x naught. F of x exists. So the function exists, it's defined, it's predictable, and the definition matches the prediction. And now we're gonna use the same idea for continuity for multiple variables. But the question is, how does our limit definition hold up? Remember differentiability, how is derivative defined? Again, in terms of a limit. As x goes to x naught, f of x minus f of x naught, x minus x naught. So this is the limit of the slopes of secant lines. I don't wanna go back and relive that language right now, but we will reuse it. We also had this alternate description, which focused on the length of the interval closing. That's a little more useful to us here. F of X plus H minus F of X over H. This is a little bit more useful form to us today. But both of these ideas, continuity, and differentiability are defined in terms of limit. So we have to have limit in order to have any hope of defining these concepts in three-dimensional space. The definitions of continuity and differentiability won't change very much, but the concept of limit is more difficult in space. When I have a function in plane, and I want to examine the limit to the point, I only can approach that point from the left or from the right. From the right, a little plus sign, from the left with a little minus sign. And so to have a two-side limit means these two limits agree well, that's a pretty straightforward test. I compute two numbers and I see if they're the same. And if they're the same, the limit exists. And if they're not the same, or if one of them doesn't exist, then the limit does not exist. This is in the plane. This is a function of one variable. But the moment, I graduate to a function of two variables. Let's pop this up for you. Then the domain is a plane. And the point that I want to approach, let's call this point C. Well, let's be more specific, X naught, Y naught, that I want to approach 
y not position on the y axis, x not position on the x axis. There is no more just left and right. I could approach it from a fixed x not. I could approach it from a fixed y not. Let me draw the plane for you only to emphasize what I'm saying. There's my point x not y not. I could approach, not only can I approach this point in infinitely many different ways, not just two different ways, infinitely many different ways, I could also approach on different styles of paths. I could approach on horizontal line, vertical line. I could approach on any line I please. I could approach on a parabola. I could approach in a spiral. Now, the limit as x and y approach x naught, y naught, I suddenly have a serious problem that I don't just have to compute two things and see if they mass match. I have to possibly compute infinitely many things and see if they match. Well, computing infinitely many things may take infinitely long time. So that's not a very good plan. I'm going to have to come up with some other plan. Now, in many cases, I don't have to be as worried about the limit as possible. For example, say, let's take limit of x, y goes to 3, 2. And let's take the function x squared y minus 3x times the square root of y. Here's a very simple function, a polynomial analytic function. And the square root is just an algebraic function. And I may not like the number I get, but as x approaches 3 and y approaches 2, the number that I'm approaching is clear. There's nothing messing with these functions in either way. So it doesn't matter which of the infinitely many paths I choose. I approach nine times two minus nine times the square root of two. And that's, well, it depends on how you want to factor that out. Nine times two minus root two. So for ordinary continuous functions, and remember polynomials are continuous, square root is continuous where it's defined, and the products of continuous functions are continuous, even when they're from different variables, then the limit is ordinarily well behaved. So I don't have to draw this picture to notice that this function is becoming nine times two minus root two no matter how I approach three and two. But when I start to mess with the numbers and say, remember, there are some things I'm not allowed to do to numbers. Take square root of negative number in the real valued functions. Divide by zero. Take logarithm of a number that's not positive. Let's say I approach zero and zero for a classical problem. And let's say I have x to the fourth plus y squared divided by x squared plus y squared plus one. Now top and bottom are polynomials in x and y. And so they're definitely continuous and that means their limit exists and matches the value of the function at that point. So I can plug in zero and zero. And when I plug in zero and zero, notice that the denominator is equal to one. So I'm evaluating the limit by checking the value at that point. I only am allowed to do that because I know this is continuous. At zero, zero, the limit of this function is zero.
And if I look at this function a little bit more closely, notice this denominator is never equal to zero. I have no threat of dividing by zero because x squared plus y squared is a number that's greater than equal to zero. If I add one, I even raise the function one unit higher. And what does that mean? It doesn't matter what point I approach, I might get a different value. You know, what if I change this to eight and zero? Well, then I've got eight to the fourth. Well, I should re regret that, 40, 96. Uh, eight to the fourth is two to the 12th. I think it's 40, 96. Here's 40, 96 plus one. Forty ninety six over forty ninety seven. <coughs> if I'm multiplying correctly, I don't have to fear any point whatsoever because I always get a number, numerator and denominator, and the denominator number is never zero. So this function is continuous everywhere. But if I change that slightly. to x squared plus y squared minus one, now I have to fear to approach some points in the plane. Namely, any point that makes this denominator zero, which you recognize a circle of radius one. Remember, x squared plus y squared equals one. It means one is r squared, which means one is r. So now if I approach one zero, I might have a legitimate polynomial top and bottom. The top is legitimately going towards one. The bottom is legitimately going towards zero. But since I can't evaluate one divided by zero, I'm not sure how to evaluate this limit. So limits are gonna be well behaved generally often I always have to look out for these problems in the definition of the function. Now, this function is not even defined on the circle x squared plus y squared equals one. In fact, that's kind of a clue is if I wanted to draw this function, which I'm not going to draw this function, I think parameterizing by circles might be interesting because then I could focus on the circles that work and the circles that don't. Or it might be interesting to look up that option although I don't use this regularly, that option exclusion that we saw in Mathematica, because that could exclude a single bad curve. I, I don't use that really very often, so I'll let you look it up. So let's look at a particular function that's similar to the problem that you're going to work on over the weekend. Let's look at the function f of x, y. And I'm taking this from section 4.2. Let me give you the exact reference to the number. This is from 88 in 4.2. I modified it for your homework. But I want you to do something pretty much like this. So you have x squared y divided by x to the fourth plus y squared. And I want you to evaluate, if possible, limit as x and y approach the origin of f of x, y. So the issue that I have right here is going to be this issue of infinitely many ways to approach the origin. It's not just I approach from the left or the right. It's not just I approach horizontally or vertically. If I legally want to use my skills from the previous calculus class, I'll have to approach this point in infinitely many different ways. 
if I want to establish a limit here. Now, frankly, what we're going to find out is this limit doesn't exist. But even to show that, I'll have to show you what? I'll have to show you different limits from different directions. So the book points out, let's say we want to approach along the x-axis. Here's my point zero, zero at the origin. And, and I su suspect something stranger is happening here than before. This is not a constant divided by zero. This is zero divided by zero. If I evaluate both of these, numerator and denominator both have well-established limits, but zero divided by zero is not defined. And in fact, zero divided by zero, you learn in your calculus experience can be almost anything. That's what we call indeterminate. Now in calculus one, you had a tool for dealing with that called L'Hopital's rule. But we don't have such a tool here immediately. So we're gonna have to try different ways to approach the origin. Let's approach along the line y equals zero. Well, then I'm taking the limit. If y is fixed to be zero, that x goes to zero of f of x and zero. And you say, aren't you gonna run into the same problem of zero divided by zero? Well, let's check it out. F of x and zero, that means put an x for x, zero for y. What that gives me is zero divided by x to the fourth. You say, isn't that zero over zero? Well, remember your order of operations. First, I can establish what zero divided by x to the fourth is. Zero divided by x to the fourth is zero. And the limit as x goes to zero of zero is zero. Don't stick the zero in here immediately, right? You have to simplify this algebraically if you can. Zero divided by x to the fourth is zero. And taking the limit, you have to be careful. Taking the limit right here means that you have to evaluate all the x's, not just, you're not plugging in x equals zero. Only for a continuous function can you plug in that value. Okay, as I approach along the x-axis, left or right, I think the function is at height zero. Let's approach along the y-axis. That's when x is zero. I'm gonna literally repeat this calculation. Now I have the limit as y goes to zero of f of zero and y. See, that's how this limit reduces. The two variable limit, if I make that restriction, reduces to a single variable limit. And the same here, the two variable limit reduces to a single variable limit. So what I get right here, let's put in zero for X and Y, I get limit as Y goes to zero of zero on top, Y squared on the bottom. It's also zero. Okay, as I approach horizontally or vertically, the limit of this function is zero. Let's try one more. Let's try along any line, not just horizontal vertical lines. This is any line. Well, I don't have the vertical line. Y, vertical line isn't represented by Y equals KX, but a vertical line was represented by this green calculation right here. So now this limit as X and Y goes to zero, zero, reduces to limit only as x goes to zero of f of x and kx. I'm kind of parameterizing how I look at that function. I plug in x and kx for x and y, so we get x squared kx, that's the y on the top, x to the fourth plus k 
squared x squared. That's the bottom. Oh, sorry, I have to take the limit as x goes to zero there, squeeze that in. And that is kx cubed. Did I evaluate that correctly? Looks like it. As x goes to zero over x fourth, k squared, x squared. Now you see what I can evaluate here is I can cancel out x squared between the top and bottom. And I reach this limit, x goes to zero of kx over x squared plus k squared. Again, this is very able to evaluate. As x goes to zero, the bottom becomes k squared, whatever k I chose. The top becomes zero again. And for any k I choose, except k equals zero, but k equals zero is the horizontal line, which we already dealt with in red. For any k I choose, this is zero. There's no question about that. As long as k is not zero, but I've already dealt with that in red. So what did I just show you? I approach the origin on any line under the sun, horizontal, vertical, slanted, and I always get limit zero. Well, case closed. This function much, much approach zero as I approach the origin. This has got to be a very mellow, well-behaved function. But when you draw it, it doesn't look mellow and well-behaved. So let's give a drawing of this uh, in a very, let's go back to the same notebook I'm using here. So I'll just erase everything right there. So let's call this uh, section 2. I'm looking at problem number 88. And I have my function that I will define, which is x raised to the 2 times y divided by, I'm going to have to write in parentheses, x raised to the 4 plus y raised to the 2. Got it. And now let's plot this around the origin. I'm sorry, I do have to share a screen. Again, I'm just in too much of a hurry. So I just take the same notebook that I shared with you a second ago and I erase the contents, just select all, delete, and I am resetting this. Now, when I select it all and delete, I did not erase the variable assignments I had made before. So I have to deal with all the variable assignments I still make. So I'm just redefining the variable f. f of x comma y. And let's look at x goes from minus 2 to 2, and y likewise. Whoops. Something is going on here, and it doesn't look like predictable to me. What is limit? Limit is predictable. And as I approach the origin, it looks like someone has taken this sheet of paper or sheet of rubber and violently pinched it. I always got to be nervous when I see violet pinches, violent pinches like this, because I have all kinds of values of this function near the origin. I have low values. I have high values. I truly do approach zero along the horizontal or vertical lines. In fact, I could probably pick any straight line and approach zero as well. I could parameterize in that fashion. But what I have something here that makes me suspicious is I have two troughs approaching the origin at a low level, and then two mountain ridges approaching the origin at a high level. 
Now the two troughs and the two ridges are reminiscent of parabolas. And then I go back to my original function. I do not see a parabola here. I mean, nobody wrote y equals x squared, but there is a kind of a y to x squared activity or ratio going on here, right? So this is a plotting that would benefit from parametric presentation, similar to your homework. Let's move to parametric plot. In fact, I keep this and I'll set up a new parametric plot and I'll just do that by copy, paste, parametric plot. That gives me too much parametric plot. And I will, again, set up a three-dimensional point which has x, x comma y, comma z, but I'll replace the y with not x squared. That's one parabola. Right? That's one parabola in space. But I want to do lots of parabolas. Let's do kx squared. And then k becomes a new variable in this plotting. And let's run k from uh, minus two to two. Okay, what I get is some kind of weird action here. Whoops, did I say kx squared in the z coordinate? No, I did not. Notice it says kx, when I just type k and x next to each other, Mathematica thinks I'm defining a new variable called kx, a name called kx. I have to either separate with a space before Mathematica recognizes I'm multiplying two already defined variables. Of course, safe is just using an asterisk. And now I'm getting a different view of this surface. I tried to bring this, but still it's a little bit out of control and messy, uh, particularly because I've got this long, crazy box, right? Mathematica tries to draw as much of this surface as I asked it to. So let's do this, minus two to two. Let's restrict the z also from minus two to two. So let's say plot range. And x, y, and z, minus two to two. And copy and insert commas appropriately. And now I'm dealing with just a piece of this function. And look at it from above. It's parameterized by parabolas. But what's really happening is what? As I approach the origin, in fact, I could do this with a little axes information. So let's set axes equal to true. We want it to draw axes. And let's put the axes origin at 0, 0, 0. I guess I don't need this first plot here for a second. I might resurrect it later. So here, as I approach the origin, do you see I'm kind of on a vertical wall between uh, whatever these two values are, I'll have to work it out. But I'm kind of on a vertical wall of parabolas. Now, I don't see the troughs as nicely as I did. I see a part of the trough, part of the ridge. That's because I've only drawn some parabolas, right? K from what parabolas did I draw? Uh, why is it angry about that semicolon? That's odd. Well, let's comment it out if it's angry so I don't have to look at that. 
I only ran K from minus two to two. Let's run K from minus 10 to 10. Well, now I've colored in a lot more of that surface. And I see a lot more of that trough, but I see how I approach on different parabolas and I get different heights. This means this limit does not exist. Now notice I'm also getting a wavy action here, like a distortion, because I'm asking it to draw lots of parabolas. Let's pump it up to 20 by 20 parabolas. Now I get serious distortion in this surface, which I could address by asking it to use more points. Plot points. And let's, plot points talks about how many points left, right, up, down, in each direction, I'll say 25 points, Mathematica suggested. That smooths it out a little bit. What if I said each direction 50 points? That smooths it out considerably. And now I see that pinching in the paper. Now you're a little bit nervous, like what's about this missing stuff right here? But you realize that's because I haven't drawn enough parabolas. I've only drawn y equals 20x squared. There might be another way I could fill in that space right there. I think there is, but I'll let you think about that a little bit. Let's do plot range one to one here to blow this up a little bit more. And let's do, to emphasize the distortion, let's make sure that we're setting up the box ratios at what, four to four to two? Not one to one to one, but four to four to two. I just subtracted the X, Y, and Z links. Of course, I could have said two to two to one. Okay, so now I have a fair description of this. The mesh lines are that Mathematica is trying to draw are a little bit distracting, so I'll say mesh is none. And now I'm just looking at the pinched piece of paper. So there's a reason why this limit doesn't exist, because at the origin, I'm undergoing some violent pinching of the surface, some crushing of the surface. I want you to examine a similar function in your homework just for practice using parametric plot. But if you can, can you figure out how to fill in these spaces here so I get a fuller representation of the surface? I mean, this is showing me what I need to know, but it's kind of like giving me the false impression that there's no surface here. Actually, I think the surface levels out nicely in both of these places. At height zero, in fact, it levels out. Okay, so this is what I have to be nervous about when I execute limits in multiple dimensions. I have to be nervous that it's not just enough to approach the limit point infinitely many different ways, even if I could, but the style at which I approach the limit point could affect the value of the limit. Okay, I want to move on from here, but you can use, now you can address questions of limits and continuity using the parameterizations like that. You can try different problems in there. Sometimes things that look like they have problems don't really have problems if you parameterize the surface intelligently. Remember from your calculus one days, sometimes you could take a function that wasn't continuous and make it continuous by doing what? Filling in a simple hole. But that function we just showed you at the origin did not have a simple whole. It wasn't just missing a single value. There was a hole at that origin. There was no definition of that function. Excuse me. There's no definition of this function at the origin. But in fact, based on the limit, there's not even a definition you could suggest. Remember what you used to call that? In calculus, removable versus essential discontinuities. A removable discontinuity in calculus 
was a function that had an acceptable limit. It just didn't have a definition at that point. You could make the function continuous by simply adding a single point. But sometimes functions might have a jump between two predictions and there's no dot you could fill in. You can't remove this dot and put it down here. You can't put a dot in the middle. There's no dot that you could add to fill in this discontinuity that was called essential. In this case, the discontinuity is essential because I have many, many different limit values as I approach the origin on different parameters. If you want to check this out, do the algebra and approach, do the algebra, evaluate this limit with y equals kx squared instead of y equals kx, and you'll see the different limit values. Okay, but we want to transition. I mean, we can talk about bad things for a long time. We want to transition to good cases as well. So I'm going to assume I don't have a surface with any obvious problems. Or if I have a surface with problems at a certain point, I'm going to assume I'm not looking at that point. We talked about limit and continuity. I want to see if I can extend differentiable to space. I want to expand, extend differentiability. I want to, well, it's an ultimate dream, but I want to take the tangent line from your calculus class and turn it into a tangent plane. So let's just talk about a generic surface. I'm gonna make this drawing relatively large so I can make more drawing on it. Traditional X, Y, and Z axes. Labeled as such, according to the right-hand rule. Remember, I could call this the X axis, Y axis, and Z axis if I don't wanna cause any consternation if I name a point X, Y, and Z. And let's draw a surface in here, just some generic surface. Try to make it a little bit interesting though. Let's go. Well, this is an artist's rendition of a surface. This is not a real surface. Well, I mean, I guess it's a rendition of a surface projected on two dimensions, kind of a bubbly surface, a parachute, a rubber sheet with uh, peaks. And I don't know if this is the valley right here, but it's certainly a lower point. And let's pick out a point on the X and Y axis. Let's call this X naught. Let's call this point right here. X not Y not. And let's talk about the problem of slope in space. So at this point called X not Y not, I certainly have a height of this function. Let's call that height Z not. Uh, my problem here is my drawing is going to get too messy very fast. So this surface is z equals f of x and y. And the problem is, how do I define a slope on the surface? How do I define slope in general? Because let's say you were sitting on this mountain with a pair of skis on your feet and the mountain was covered in snow. Well, you already know this if you've ever tried to ski or snowboard, uh, which is you know relatively dangerous. The mountain might have different slope where you're standing, depending on which direction you point the skis. So if I take 
this constant y naught right here on this line that's parallel to the x-axis. And if I project that line up onto the surface, that might be a relatively gentle slope. We'll call this slope. It's a curve, it's got a tangent line. Let's call this slope in the x direction because I'm walking along the x direction, I'm using a fixed y. But, let's see what other pens I have available to me. Maybe this is too light, but let me know. If I fix the x knot and I transfer that up and see how it cuts the surface. This is a trace, by the way. That's why I liked that question earlier this morning. Might have a pretty extreme slope at that point. Let's call that tangent line. Have a slope of y, my. My drawing is getting too messy. Do you see what I'm going to say? If I have a tangent line with one slope in the x direction, a tangent line with another slope in the y direction, if they meet at that point x naught, y naught, z naught, what I have is two lines, get my hand in here, two lines meeting at a point tilted in different directions. I've got a plane. I'm, I have this hope that I could create a tangent plane to the surface. But I have to solidify what I am calling mx and my because I hadn't had to consider this before. When I drew curves of one variable, calculus of one variable, then I had only what? I had only one slope at a point, if a slope was defined at all. But here I have a slope every different way I point my skis. In fact, I could have infinitely many slopes, depending on if I point my skis in yet another direction, but we'll come to that later. Let's just see if we can resolve what it means to have a slope in the x direction or the y direction. Well, I'm gonna use my old friend, the difference quotient. And that is, if I only concentrate on the curves in one direction at a time, I can write the difference quotient just as I did before. But I am talking about a function of two variables. So what I've got to do is freeze one of the variables and take the derivative in the other direction. Let's see if we can write that. Let's take the limit as h goes to zero of, now I'm looking at mx. That means I'm freezing y naught. So f of x plus h, I'm looking at the variation of the x direction, y naught, minus f of x, y naught, as h goes to zero. Since I'm interested in the point x naught, y naught in particular, I could say mx at x naught, y naught. I could say, let's look at x naught, y naught like this. This is, again, secant lines becoming a tangent line, just like you did in calculus. But here I'm only doing the difference quotient in the x slot. I could imitate the y slot. Same way, f of x naught, y naught plus h, minus f of x naught, y naught. People use different letters to represent things divided by h. These are two difference quotients. But since they're restricting themselves to two traces, two different traces, two different legitimate curves in a plane, each one of these traces is a curve in the plane. I can use my calculus weapon, which taught me how to take slopes of curves and planes. Now the MX and MY right here, they're called derivatives, but they're given a different definition because I want to emphasize I'm freezing the y value or freezing the x value. So instead of df dx, like there's only one, we say partial f partial x at x naught y naught. 
this is the partial derivative of f with respect to x, the partial derivative of f with respect to y. So use a kind of a funny curly d if you like at x not y not. So these are the slopes in the x and y direction. Sometimes people say f sub x to mean partial derivative in the x not y not direction. It's not such a romantic notation. It doesn't look flourishy and curly. But you have to get used to people doing either one. So when someone talks about a partial derivative, excuse me, they literally mean you are freezing one of the variables and only differentiating with respect to the other. I could do this with two variables, three variables, I could do it with 10 variables, but the picture is more meaningful in the two variable case. Let's say if I take a function of three variables, oh, 3x squared y minus sine z x squared. That's enough trouble for right now, isn't it? What happens if I freeze the y and z and only take the derivative with respect to the x direction? I just pretend that y and z are constants. So with respect to x, this is 6xy minus, ooh, chain roll time, derivative of sine is cosine of what's inside, leave it alone. And then I have to chain roll, respect the inside but I'm only differentiating the inside with respect to x. So differentiate zx squared with respect to x is 2xz, which is different than the partial derivative of f with respect to z. Now there's only one z present. This is just a big old constant with respect to z, freezing the x and y. Let's take the derivative with respect to z. Again, I get minus cosine, derivative of sine is cosine and zx squared, derivative of the outside function at the inside function and derivative of the inside function, but with respect to z, is just an x squared. I could put the x squared out front for clarity. I don't like writing this on the back end of the cosine because I don't want you to think this is inside the cosine. So this idea is called partial derivative. And I'm presenting an example that's not very complicated right here. I mean, you have all your derivative techniques, you know, but it, to do partial derivatives, what you got to do is like freeze your mind on the other variables. You got to like block out seeing the other variables or not block them out entirely, but pretend that they're constants. And sometimes it's hard to do is to say, oh, I got to pretend that's a constant. And then let's do the second order partial derivative of f and let's now do it x and then z. Well, this, we got to read in an order, right? Is it x and then z or is it z then x? No, this is the partial derivative with respect to x applied to the partial derivative with respect to z. So now I've got to do product rule and chain rule. First times the derivative of the second, derivative of cosine is minus sine. So this is sine dx squared, and then chain rule kicks in. I have to multiply this by the derivative of this with respect to x, which is 2xz. But now second times the derivative of the first, so minus 2x cosine zx squared. So you got to have all your rules in play, and you got to be able to selectively say, oh, I'm Differentiate with respect to z first and then x. Here, x and y are constants. Here, x and z are constants, or y and z are constants. There was no y in the partial derivative f with respect to z, by the way. It makes this a little extra layer of confusing is that this is the partial derivative of z and then with respect to x. So when people use this notation, they write, the variables in this order. This says do the derivative with respect to z first and then x. They read it from left to right. But when you write in this notation, Leibniz's notation, you put the z first on the right and then the x. So 
to be careful. You have to know both of these notations. You have to be careful and fluent in both of these notations. Make sure you can differentiate with respect to any variable you're given, considering the other variables to be constants. Now, this is going to take some practice. Oh, and by the way, I have a problem that I'm posting for this. I, I identified the problem, but I haven't posted it yet. So uh, sometime today, I'll turn on the second problem I want you to work on over the weekend. The website just has one problem listed or has one problem listed and the other problem not linked. I'll turn that on if I can get to it sometime today or this morning while you're working on your other homework problem. But if you can master this idea of doing derivatives with respect to only one variable at a time, that will open the door to constructing slopes in different directions. And that will allow us to create tangent planes. Now, uh, having a partial derivative does not mean that this function is differentiable. So we're going to have this problem again of having to look in multiple directions. But if I want to understand what differentiable means in any sense, then I still do have to have at least derivatives in any one direction. Okay, I just wanted to create a mind picture right here. Notice this is a function of two variables I drew my picture with, but I can differentiate partial derivative with respect to any number of variables any number of times I want. So practice, you're going to practice this weekend doing some partial derivatives, focusing only on one variable at a time. Okay, this could be good for today. Uh, Use the parabola parameterization on the problem you're working on. I demonstrated how to do a level curve and a trace. See what you can do with that. The function that you're working with, several of you showed me pictures of the function you're working with for tonight's homework. Mathematica, even in the raw plot 3D, did a fair job of drawing the function. A lot of scraggliness around the undefined places. But if you parameterize the function you're dealing with with parabolas, you'll get a much smoother image of the function. Still, that function is messy. And it's not easy to calculate with that. And some people have asked questions and observed that already. So let's see what you can do with that function. That's not a simple function I have to do. OK, I'm going to stop recording, but I'll hang out here for a second if you have a